Hello, my name is Pie Kiss Chris. And I'm Bastard Swordsman. And this is another exciting episode of Scenes from a Podcast. The uh, only... The most, po the most exciting podcast you'll ever listen to. Yes. You know, it's it's like... It's like... like it's so yeah. exciting, we can't even describe it in words. That's how exciting it's, it is. It's really, it's so just cerebral that human language just isn't able to describe it. Your, your gray matter is going to be leaking out of your ears. Yeah. And I, don't, I don't think that's a good thing, though. Uh, I, I, I've been doing pretty fine without it lately, but, you know, yeah. each their own. <clears throat> mm. Anyways, stay with us a while. Put up your boots on the table. Uh, make sure they're not muddy. And uh, we're going to be talking about what we've been up to lately, and then we'll get on to talking about today's film. So, uh, Mr. Swordsman, what have you been up to recently? I'm still reading Infinite Jest. Uh, pretty good book, actually, now that I'm not quite halfway through, but approaching the halfway mark. I'm more than a third of the way through. Yeah, and I, I can confidently say it's a pretty good book. I'm not, like, totally personally in love with it, but it has some uh, parts that I really like and uh, really affected me. Um, yeah, it's a pretty good book, and I would recommend if you can handle, like, crazy, over-the-top prose, like, long-ass run-on sentences and paragraphs, and, uh, the fact that there is a glossary for, like, just random things, like, there are some actual events in the story, that like entire like chapters that are just listed as glossary things so you'll be reading a chapter and then there's like a footnote like and then you skip to the end the glossary and it's just an entire like scene itself and then some of those have their own mini glossaries a glossary within a glossary yeah. Must be some pretty highbrow stuff if they got to explain all of that. I mean, mm, I, I don't know. I, I feel like just the way it's built is sort of like supposed to have some inner meeting itself. And it's kind of, I can't tell if it's also supposed to like be making fun of like sort of higher brow like pretentious types but i don't know because there are also just some parts that are like alphabet soup there are a million like acronyms for different terms and sometimes um he'll refer to characters just as their abbreviations like well not abbreviations but their initials and that's it but yeah Also, the uh, new volume of ReZero came out in English, so I read that. It was pretty all right. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, how does it stack up to previous issues? Um, well, it's not really issues. It's a light novel series, but... Uh, um, not really one of my favorites, but it's... Uh, it's volume 21, which is the f uh, beginning of the sixth arc in the series, and I've heard very good things from the arc, but it just is mostly sort of, like, setting up the arc, and there's not really a lot of, like, big stuff involving, like, you know, the themes of the arc or big character progressions. So, eh. It's mostly just, um... It's mostly just, like, stuff happening then? Yeah. 
There is one really over the top definite though, where like a character has their like, uh, while well, they're split into two, um, horizontally, not vertically, but like so, their top comes off from their like bottom, and it like, d and like it describes their like organs falling out and viscera splattering everywhere and like them still being alive and like screaming and shit and I'm like mm, that's a bit much they're a lot more resilient than most people if they're still alive after that i think they die like a few se like a few seconds after but yeah yeah well <clears throat> I, I guess it's kind of like the chicken's body running around after you've already cut off its head, like that sort yeah. of thing. Uh, what about you? All right, so um, <clears throat> only major thing I've been up to is I recently found out about this um. I'd call him a writer, but he doesn't really write fiction so much as he does write um, conspiracy theories. Uh, Astrid Swordsman? No. <laughs> no, no. Not not you. Uh, his no. name is... Have you ever heard of Francis E. Deck? Um, I don't think so. All right. So, so this guy was, um, a second generation Polish immigrant. He was a lawyer. Yeah. He was a lawyer for like this, this firm and he got fired for, you know, um, abusing, like breaking the law basically. And sometime after this, he had a schizophrenic breakdown and started sending out letters warning people about this vast conspiracy in which everyone's brains were removed from their bodies and were actually being placed on cities on the dark side of the moon and our bodies were just slave puppets being controlled by um Frankenstein technology and all I can of, believe that. and all of this was part of the machinations of a ancient supercomputer created by this Sloven empire thousands of years ago called the gangster computer god that is, is that really the, what it's called? That's really what he calls it, the gangster computer god. And he sent out these letters throughout, like, the 80s, I think, warning people and, and like, begging for money so that he could, like, spread the message and save the universe from the gangster computer god. Mm -hmm. So There's yeah. another, um... Polish guy called Ted Kaczynski, well, Polish American, I think, who was, um, I think it was the the Unabomber or whatever, or maybe I'm totally stupid in getting my uh, domestic terrorists mixed up, but uh, I think you're right. I think that is the Unabomber. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's him. Yeah, he's pretty cool though, because. He's anti-modernism and anti-technology and all that. Remember, everything we say is 100% unironic. We I, I feel yeah, too many people have been irony poisoned these days. Um, I don't know, people aren't really genuine these days anymore. Yeah. You, you know, sometimes you just gotta gotta make a bold political statement you know just even if it's controversial you gotta stand up and say it speak oh not really something big but something funny 
Um, speaking of bold political statements, Kanye West recently made a post that was pretty funny. Push people again because he watched 21 Jump Street and he really loved Jonah Hill in it. Really? Yeah. <sighs> Jonah Hill. Is he Jewish? Yeah. Okay. It would have been kind of funny if he wasn't. Ah, uh, it was really funny, but the way I described it probably wasn't didn't really get the humor across. No, no, I mean, other people probably got it. I'm just a dumbass who just. No, he said no because he was making all those anti-Semitic remarks. Um, because he got kicked off of Instagram and something, and I, I think the guy who runs Instagram is Jewish. I, I have no idea. I, I don't run Instagram, but he was mad at Jewish people. Uh, and so then he made the, oh, I love Hitler comments. And then like a few, not a few days ago, it, I think it was like a week or so ago when he said, I, n I now... Uh, Jonah Hill and 21 Jump Street made me love Jewish people again. <laughs> That's all it takes to fight anti-Semitism. Yeah, um, traveling back to Germany in 1933 and showing Hitler 21 Jump Street starring Jonah Hill. My God, what have I done? Well, no, it's 1933, so it's before the oh, yeah. you know the whole Holocaust thing. Okay, well, actually, years are very important, um, as we'll get into later on today in this episode. Yes. Do you want to start talking about today's movie? Why? Yes, I do. Um. Okay, so. Uh, I recommended a Russian film, and I know that's not, you know, the sort of cool thing to do now, but I've been interested in it for a while. It's called The Return from 2003, directed by Andrei Zvogintsev, and there's a Z at the beginning. Zvogintsev, but it's, it's like Zvogintsev. And I'm probably butchering that because his name is spelled like, I mean in a way that's borderline unpronounceable for an English speaker. Uh, yeah, and basically the premise of the film is uh, there are these two Russian boys named Andre and Ivan, and their father finally comes back after he had gone out for cigarettes 12 years ago, and he takes them on a little road trip and yeah um chris what did you think of the return uh i really liked this film i didn't really know what the premise would be going into it um mainly i'm just a sucker for films about the relationship between like parents and children especially like really strained relationships uh so 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 yeah this like really appealed to my biases but uh just mm -hmm. as interesting to me is the way like the relationship not just between the the father and the sons but also the brothers between each other sort of play out because they both sort of have different views of the father and that sort of plays into how the father treats both of them throughout the film. I, I, yeah. Um, I like how you're never really told why the father returns or why he's like taking them on this trip. Like you're never explicitly told that and you just sort of have to like come to your own conclusion about it. Um, I don't know. It, it's nice to have a film that, you know, 
actually requires the audience to fill in some blanks itself and doesn't treat them like idiots. Oh, I mean, even then, like, why the father comes back isn't really important. It's yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's it's told through the perspective of the of the son, uh, mostly Andre, and it's really all about him sort of becoming disillusioned with his father the more time he spends with him and in the more like sort of physical and emotional abuse he sort of suffers at his hands yeah yeah so, so one thing oh i can like hear myself in the recording this is really awkward but anyway One thing I noticed is that it says the father had been gone for 12 years and the film came out in 2003 and the big event for Russia in 1991 was the collapse of the Soviet Union. So, yeah, I like to, well, I, it's not that I like to interpret i think it's kind of obvious that the dad is supposed uh supposed to represent the soviet union i mean there is definitely they do say he has like a military history so he's probably connected with it in some way uh yeah i think like spoilers by the way oh yeah spoilers for the return yeah this is like this is really the I, I already kind of spoiled something, but yeah. This is really like the only like spoiler and it's like not really something that's like explained, but like it's sort of implied. So like near the the end of the film, like the father takes them to this island and he like digs up this box of something. You know, it's kind of like the the box from the suitcase from Pulp Fiction. You don't really ever figure out what's in it. Uh, well, I think, I think the thing with the suitcase is that there was money in it, but... I mean, that's an oh, no. implication, but, like, it's... I think it's sort of, like, implied that he might have been doing something on the side during his military service, and he wanted to, like, come back for it after he, like, left it behind for safekeeping, and he was using, like, time off with his family as, like, an excuse to get it. You know, mm. I mean, that's is, my interpretation anyway. My interpretation is that the pictures that you see at the end is just what was in the box. Oh, yeah. From the credits. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's actually really interesting. I didn't even. I mean, that that like raises further questions because it's like he's sentimental now, but he still doesn't hesitate to like treat them all like garbage so it's like i mean russia yeah no but seriously uh well no when i said i think he represents the soviet union i think like literally like in an allegorical sense yeah and the i think the film is sort of about like two kids or, like or not not kids but just about how like the Russian people sort of had to adapt to this new Russia and you know after like post Soviet Union and this film is sort of about like you know what it would be like if the Soviet Union did return and I think um well the the film posits that like it would be impossible because then the father like you know just dies And yeah, it's kind of like impossible to reconcile uh, uh, the present Russia with the past Russia, basically. That is an interesting interpretation. Uh, I didn't really think about it that way when I saw it, but there's there's definitely like a a credence to the idea. I also think yeah. it it works pretty well as like if that is the director's intention, it it works really well as just like a straight commentary on like abusive fathers and, mm -hmm. and and just like 
I don't use this word as loosely as like some other people do, but I, I do definitely think the father represents the idea of toxic masculinity. You know, this idea that manhood comes from this stern, sort of distant, uh, no compromise, and that like raising your sons to be like that, no matter what mm. methods is always justified and really how it like it it you know he he doesn't like realize that he's like fucking them up in in his mind it's like oh i'm just toughening toughening them up i'm yeah you know raising them to be strong men like me you know yeah i mean going off of my interpretation i feel like he just sort of represents a lot of the ideals of the Soviet Union, and some of those are very outdated, but also, like, he definitely isn't a great father, obviously, but there are moments where it seems like, you know, he does have somewhat, like, good intentions, like, he encourages Ivan not to waste his, uh, bread and soup, and he's really insistent on getting him to eat it, and... Uh, I think that sort of calls back to, you know, how under the Soviet Union there were a lot of, like, famines and stuff, and people didn't have a lot of food to eat. Yeah, it's... It's definitely, like, a film that I say, whether it's commentating on, like, the Soviet Union... Uh, specifically or not, it, it definitely has something to say about, like, sort of Russian ideals of, because again, that, that sort of notion of, of that very particular idea of masculinity, the, that the father represents, that seems very tr tied to the, the Russian identity. And, yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the stereotypical image of the big muscular bearded man who wrestles bears and whatever. Named Ivan. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, um, well, take it with a grain of salt, but there's actually a quote from our good friend Vladimir Putin, and basically uh, he said, um, any Russian that doesn't regret the passing of the Soviet Union has no heart, but anyone who wants it restored has no brain. Of all the people to say something like that, he is not the sort of person I would think to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I mean, his whole fucking MO is like, like doing a tribute song to the Soviet Union, so like... Yeah, I mean... Yes, I think we should clarify just, you know, for our small audience that Scenes from a Podcast does not endorse the actions of Vladimir Putin. I think that's very important to get across because yeah. we are a serious podcast. Yeah. We, uh, we don't support what's happening in Ukraine at all. Well, I mean, I, I support, like, the Ukrainians. No, I mean, like, we... I meant, like, I don't support, like, what Russia's doing to Ukraine. Sorry. I guess I could have made that statement more clear. Yeah, it's okay. I was just having a little goof. But, yeah. yeah. But I think that uh, that is, like, despite who it came from, that is a pretty good quote. And it, like, not only describes, um, you know, just, you know, the passing of the Soviet Union, but it can also describe a lot of like sort of abusive relationships like in including like familial ones like this one yeah i mean it is interesting the way they they handle the father in this film because a, a lesser movie would have made him just unrepentantly cartoonishly evil and yeah well they do make him like they do make it clear that he's a bad dude and that, like, he's not the sort of... He's not a good father. You know, he's also... He's still a person. And he's still their dad. And they still yeah. have feelings for him. 
even if it is very mixed feelings. Like they, again, spoilers, but like at the end of the film, like it's very ambiguous because it, it starts out with the the dad threatening to kill Ivan for like disobeying him. And then like Andre runs away because he's so pissed off. And then he's like, wait, don't go into the forest. You might get hurt. And he actually like goes out of his way to like follow him up this this tower. No, it, it's the young kid is Ivan. Oh, Ivan. I thought Andre was the young kid. No, and, Andre is the older like teenager. All right. Sorry for uh, misidentifying the uh, abuse victims, Andre and Ivan. Yeah. Not- but but it it's very interesting because they like go out of their way to to show that he's like he still like wants to make sure this kid doesn't fall, you know? You know, he might Yeah. He doesn't actually want to kill them. Yeah. Like he has he has no respect for them. Sure, but he in his mind he still wants what's best for them. Yeah. Uh, you know, that scene where he climbs that little, like, tower thing, uh, I really like that because it calls back to the beginning of the film where all the boys are, like, jumping off that uh, pier thing into the uh, river or whatever it is. Um, fun fact, or not so fun fact, by the way, the guy who played Andre actually jumped off that and, uh, when he uh, he fell in the water and he drowned on the same day that the film premiered in Russia. Really? Yeah. So so this was after filming and he like went back to this place and he like drowned. Yeah, um he he like jumped off that same thing. Okay. And he didn't survive. I think that um sort of enforces the bit that that is sort of you know just young male bravado and just you know doing stupid shit and but uh that scene is seen as like sort of in ivan's mind as you know a failure of courage for him and but later in the film when he's running away from his dad like his like, or, you know, him saying that he's going to jump is also a failure of courage because he's basically just running away from his problem and by jumping and killing himself, he would just be running away from that. So I think that also recontextualizes the beginning, you know, as, you know, not really being a true test of courage and all that and... Uh, That's also one of the traits that the dad wants to show the two kids, like courage, individuality, and strength. I mean, I do think it is interesting how, like, the 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 way the both the sons see the dad and are like, and how that sort of comes back to like who they are in that prologue. Like Andre mm. is the he's the the stupid bravado one, you know, he's the the one who who already sort of has like ideas of manliness and manhood being about like you know, being daring, being bold, you know, jumping off the the cliff and, and all that. Whereas Ivan is a bit more quiet and that sort of Andre gets a, along a little better with with the dad than than Ivan does, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's it's interesting because Andre, like, um, like is seeking out affection from his father more actively than Ivan, who just sort of like argues with him and is like, ah, you you don't care about us, eh. um. But, like, Andre is also the one to, like, sort of, you know, man up and, like, decide to, like, drag uh, the dad's body after he falls. So, 
in a way like he was closer to him but also he was also more genuinely believing of his ideals and sort of like tries to carry them on like immediately yeah you know it it wasn't just an act i it he really was yeah. you know I do think it is interesting how quickly he folds, though, like the moment, like his dad turns on him, too, though, because it, yeah. it, it's like a lot of that is, well, I'm the favorite son because I'm I'm the more mature one. Then I'm the older and the stronger one. But like the moment he but that also means that, like. There's more scrutiny on him when he messes up, when he doesn't live up to his expectations. Like when he when he goes out yeah. for the fishing, he he tries to like blame it on Ivan. Like, well, we we stayed out longer because that's what Ivan wanted, and it's like, yeah, but I put you in charge, and and you know that's the first time he's been treated the way he's been treated by his brother has been treated like the whole movie, and he immediately buckles and starts like going, well, I guess you should just kill me then. I hate you. You know it's two very different ways of dealing with daddy issues yeah <sighs> i like um the sort of like how blue the film is in a lot of like american films that's sort of sometimes used for like flashbacks and stuff and i think it gives it sort of like a retrospective feel to it since again i feel the film is reflecting on the soviet union and all that so it's definitely a film of the past and it's also very vague as to when the film is supposed to take place it's definitely like it's it's it had a, a very gray color palette to me which i think just sort of reflected blue gray. bluish gray yeah which i which i think you know just sort of reflected uh how depressing it is to live in russia yeah yeah you know that it's it's a very shitty country you know yeah i don't really feel repentant saying that but so yeah fun fun fact i didn't even find this out until recently but even after the collapse of the soviet union russia was still like they were a dem they're a democracy in name only i think that's a lot more obvious now that like you know with putin but like from the beginning of the russian federation post soviet union they've been a one party state so yeah not really a lot of you know freedom over there you have the freedom to you 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 you, you just have to look deep inside yourself to find freedom you know you know you, it's so true yeah you don't necessarily need things like more than one political perspective you know yeah. um a little uh, i'm not really gonna go too deep into it but i did actually in between watching this for the first time and uh talking about it on the podcast i did see another film from the director called the banishment and it also is very vague about the time period that that takes place in and that um it's it was actually kind of an expensive film because uh for the banishment they like designed like car parts and signboards like just to sort of like obscure like when the film is supposed to take place so he's got like this motif of things being like very ambiguous chronology yeah uh and the return is actually his debut 
And I think it's a pretty great debut. Yeah. I'm actually looking up the banishment right now. It's It's only like a few years like after the return. Like this the film we're talking about right now is like 2003. This is like 2007, so only like four years. Yeah, only four years. Yeah. Um, you have any uh, anything else to say? Uh, I do like how the the dad is first introduced as just being like being very vulnerable. Like he's asleep. He's not really imposing, but like they're looking over him, like like he's this. Like, he's this awe-inspiring or, like, terrifying thing. You know, it, it it's, like, a, a good contrast as to, like, how we see people and mm -hmm. how they actually are. And, you know, obviously they're kids, you know, they're more vulnerable than an adult. But it, I really do think the idea is that, like, people like that are are more like of a facade than anything else there mm -hmm. like like a lot of that strength and that dignity is is just a is is just a show and if if we're gonna uh, apply that to like this being a metaphor for the soviet union you know i feel like that speaks to like the the propaganda that that was that was behind a, a lot of even here in the West, the way we, we look at that country yeah. and whatnot. One, oh, yeah, one last thing I wanted to say, um, which ties into my theory of the box uh, having the photos at the end. Um, he put that in the ship, I be like the little boat, I believe, and it's the same boat that sinks, if I remember correctly. And uh, the dad, along with the box sinking, I think really just hammers in the point of, you know, like, moving past the Soviet Union. If only we could. If only we could. Here's mm -hmm. to hoping. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I really like this movie. I would... Uh, yeah. I would recommend uh, you watch it. I I watched a download of it. Uh, is this on any streaming services or? It's um it's on Canopy. So if you have a library membership or whatever uh, at a library that uh, can or that supports Canopy or whatever K A N O P Y is the streaming service or if you go to go to a college that has it then you can watch it for free but that's basically it uh for free streaming um you can also uh rent or buy it on youtube or amazon but i don't think there's actually been a north american release of this definitely not on blu-ray unfortunately maybe criterion will do something eventually I, I really do think that more people over here in the States ought to see this movie. It is, it is like a really good movie. And hopefully I'll be seeing more of this director's work in the future. Yeah, I, I've wanted to get into this director for a while. And this is definitely a great start uh, to his filmography. And a good first impression. Um yeah, uh, Russian films and just Eastern European films tend to be really interesting to me because, you know, they're from a made from a perspective that you don't really see a lot, uh, you know, as an American. And it's interesting to see films from like, you know, very, like very different cultures. And it sort of, you know, gets you a little like window into a far off place, which is one of the reasons why I love movies so much. 
But yeah, there are a lot of good Russian movies and even ones that were made in, under the Soviet Union, despite the, you know, horrible, like, political conditions and all that, they came out with a lot of great movies over the years, so definitely check some of those out, too. But, yeah, I would recommend this, The Return. Uh, I'd give it, like, an 8 out of 10, personally. Really liked it. Uh, I'm gonna give it a, a 9 out of 10. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> All right. So, I'm thinking that for next week's episode, uh, we're going to be talking about a film that both of us actually saw back when it was first released in 2021. Uh, Nightmare Alley by um, Guillermo del Toro. Guillermo del Toro, sorry. Uh, mm. So yeah, if you haven't seen that film, uh, go ahead. I'm pretty sure it's on Blu-ray somewhere. Well, it's on Blu-ray somewhere, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, remember to... Uh, Pray to our Lord and Savior, the gangster computer god. Yeah. All right. Well, looking forward to Nightmare Alley. Uh, if you don't want to be spoiled, uh, watch that before it comes, or be, yeah, before the episode. All right. Be seeing you next time. Peace.